You know, if you're not a very spiritual person, and you don't think about the akhirah a lot, if, if you haven't prayed for years and years and years, if you go for a burial, and you've never gone to a burial, if you go to a burial after a janazah, you follow the, the procession and you go to the burial. If you go that, that will be a spiritual experience for you. Just walking around and le- reading, re- uh, reading the gravestones, reading this guy died at the age of, or this child died at the age of 20, this one at the age of 6 months, this one at the age of 83 years, this one at the age of 31, this one was this, this one, this guy was my age, this woman, this man, this woman, and you will read that, and you, know what? you won't be thinking of them. Who will you be thinking of? Yourself. It's going to open up your eyes. The graveyard is a great place to open up your eyes, to remember where we're, we're all headed. It's a place of silence and reflection. And yet you people, you even turned the graveyard into a place of takathur. You, you couldn't even get a lesson from that. You people are hopeless. Which is why the past tense in the beginning is appropriate. Alha. It deluded you. Not that it will delude you, but it already deluded you. In other words, you are beyond hope. You people are a hopeless case. If it says it will delude you, there's still hope. Maybe it won't. Maybe I'll change because it has that potential. But if it's already happened, it means you people are a hopeless case. SubhanAllah. Now, and specifically this comment, I, I, there are many Mufassirun that have said this, but we'll just quote Shawkani, inshaAllah ta'ala, وَقِيلْ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَزُورُونَ الْمَقَابِرِ It's said that they used to visit these graves, فَيَقُولُونَ هَذَا قَبْرُ فُلَانٍ وَهَذَا قَبْرُ فُلَانٍ فَيَفْتَخِرُونَ بِذَلِكِ And they used to say, this is the grave of that great one, this is the grave of that great one, they used to take pride in saying that. كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ Identical ayat, except for what? ثم in the beginning. The rough meaning, kalla. First, let's look at the word kalla. Bima'na haqqan. Kalla means for sure. Kalla literally means not at all. No way. No way. In other words, this delusion of yours is not gonna last. No way. You're gonna wake up soon. And you, uh, and when you do wake up, you will yourself be saying, what have, what, what have I done? How, can I, how could I have been deluded? You know when people are so distracted, there are people you try to wake up and you try to tell them what, the, what life is all about and they don't want to hear it at all. And you say to yourself, man, there's no way this guy will ever, ever accept the truth. That guy is a hopeless case. This one, no way they will ever listen. Allah says to them, kalla. No, there is a time. For sure. They will listen. No more distractions. And this is after they've gone to the graves, right? After they've been buried. Now, kalla sawfa ta'alamun, the first one. Very, very soon you will find out. Sata'alamun means soon you will find out. Sawfa ta'alamun, very soon you will find out. Meaning your death is very, very close. It's not just close, it's very close. And as soon as you die, you're gonna find out. Ali radiallahu anhu used to say, An-nasu niyam. People are sleeping. He says, people are sleeping. And when they die, they wake up. They die, they wake up. This, is, this was his comment, radiallahu anhu, in regards to this ayah. So we find, kalla sawfa ta'labun, soon you will find out. Find out when? You'll find out when you go to your grave. Man, what have I been busy with? What should I have been busy with? You'll find that out pretty soon. As soon as one goes into the grave and the questioning begins, you realize how messed up you have been. That's the first one. Then he says, thumma kalla sawfa ta'labun. Then again, thumma. Some ulama comment, the second ayah is not just for emphasis, the first one is for the questioning in the grave, when you will realize how messed up you were. The second one, soon you will find out, is when you come out of the grave, when the day of judgment begins, and all of your deeds are taken out, and the whole scrolls begin, then you will really realize how distracted you had been. The full record. And the second record is more comprehensive than the first record. In In the grave you're questioned, but not thoroughly. But when you come out on the day of judgment, how are you questioned? Thoroughly, so the second questioning is more powerful than the first, which is why the second ayah has thumma, making it more powerful. Thumma is akad. It, it adds tafkhim, it adds tahweel, it adds emphasis, it adds terror, and it adds, adds uh, comprehensiveness to the phrase. So, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Kalla sawfa ta'alamun, thumma kalla sawfa ta'alamun. As Zamakhshari has an interesting comment, he says, In darun liyakhafu fayantabihu min ghaflatihim. This is a gift from Allah. This is a warning so that they may wake up from their delusion and their distraction. What takrir ta'kidun li rad'u wal indar alayhim. And this rep- repetition, the benefit of it is that when you repeat, the warning becomes stronger. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. When you do that twice, what happens? The one listening is really warned. You know, you, if you really want to stop your, your kids running into the parking lot, 
Stop, stop, stop. You don't say it once. How many times do you say it? You repeat it? The more serious the warning, naturally, what do you do? You repeat it. You're gonna find out. You're gonna find out. كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ the repetition of it actually adds to the state of urgency and the, the style of warning that Allah Azza wa Jalla is, is uh, communicating. Well, awwal ashad. And, and this, this style is used in Arabic, for example, aqulu lak, thumma aqulu. I'm telling you, man, I'm telling you. You say it again. You know, and you say this twice to get the point across to someone who does, apparently, until you say it to them this way, it won't affect them. It won't, they've, be, they're beyond the point of just casually talking to them and they're re- ready to reason. So you have to give them the stronger language. The Qur'an, you know the problem is, for us the Qur'an is in the form of book. We're reading it. But when the Qur'an was being recited to the kuffar, it wasn't being recited in the form of book. How was it being presented? Speech. And in a speech, you can emotionally affect your audience. But in writing, is not as easy to do that. In speech it is, which is why even today, if you're reading Qur'an, you may not be moved. But if you're listening to Qur'an in salah, what might happen? You'll be moved. Because the, the real effect is in speech. The real effect, heart to heart, is in speech. Somebody emails you advice, eh, I don't know. Somebody gives you advice over the, over the phone, you take it a lot more seriously. Because words, when you hear them, they just have a more, they, they are closer to the heart. Which is why even in the Qur'an, we don't find the Sahaba saying, Qara'na wa ata'na. We read and we obeyed. What did they say? Sami'na wa ata'na. We heard and we obeyed. Spe- writing is read, but speech is what? Heard. And it's so compelling that once we hear it, we're ready to obey. It's powerful speech. So this is one of the, one of the benefits of having dars al-Qur'an. Right? Lectures on the Qur'an. Inshallah, better and, and, and more qualified scholars will do them and more of them. One of the benefits of that is it revives a sunnah of the Qur'an itself. The, sun, the Qur'an first and foremost isn't meant to be read. The Qur'an first and foremost is meant to be heard. The Messenger ﷺ recites it onto the people so they can hear. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ ayatihi. And part of its power and its emotional strength is lost when you reduce it to reading. When it's not something that is heard. كَلَّا لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ No, not at all. Had you only had. لَوْ is كَلِمَةَ الْحَصْرِ It's a word used to express um, what's called uh, regret. So Allah Azza wa Jalla is expressing regret on their behalf and saying, if you only knew, if you only had knowledge. What kind of knowledge? He says, عِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ If you had knowledge of certainty. Had you known the knowledge of certainty. There's عِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ a few ayat later, we'll find something else. We'll find عين اليقين. Okay? ثم لا ترونها عين اليقين. So there's two now. There's the knowledge of certainty. There's the eye of certainty. These are figures of speech. We'll talk about each of them, inshaAllah ta'ala. Then in the Quran, there's a third one, which occurs twice. Allah Azza wa Jalla uses the word حق اليقين. وإنه لحق اليقين. So there's علم اليقين, عين اليقين, and حق اليقين. There are three of them. If one has to understand all three and the relationship between them before we understand these ayat properly. So let's do that inshaAllah ta'ala. First of all, let's look at the word yaqeen itself. That's the common denominator between these three phrases. Two of these phrases once again are in this surah. Which two phrases? Ilm al yaqeen and Ain al yaqeen And the other, the third phrase doesn't occur in this surah, it occurs elsewhere, twice. And this is haqqul yaqeen. Haqqul yaqeen. Okay? So let's first again, let's look at the meaning of the word yaqeen. Imam Raghib says, اليقين من صفة العلم فوق المعرفة أو الدراية He says, Yaqeen is a, a kind of knowledge that is above just being familiar with something or having information about something. It is a higher form of knowledge. That's the first attribute. So it's more than just knowing, having Yaqeen. I'd like to translate the word Yaqeen with the words solid conviction or unflinching conviction. You're absolutely, absolutely, absolutely convinced of something, then you use the word yaqeen. This is even stronger than iman, by the way. This is, and we'll see why it's even stronger than iman when it's used. Then we find Abu Hilal al Askari commenting on the word yaqeen. He says, Al yaqeen sukunun nafs wa nahju sadr bima alima. This is very important. Two parts. He says, yaqeen is something you are so convinced of that deep inside you are satisfied with it. You're okay with what it says. You know, there's one thing, somebody says there's an afterlife and you say, yeah, I guess it makes sense. I guess it's possible. 
Right? Okay, I'm willing to accept that. That's not yaqeen. That's a casual acceptance. But you say for sure, for sure, as sure as yesterday, <laughs> as sure as you are sitting before me, that certain that there is an akhirah, now this becomes yaqeen. And I'm sad in my heart, this is not just a casual thing, it's become firm. This is the first attribute of yaqeen. The second, وَنَهْجُ sadr. مِمَا عَمِلَ So one, you're, you're not... Actually, this was the second. The first is sukoon nafs which is you don't think about it again. It's not something you revisit. It's done. It's an absolute reality. It's a premise which you don't go back and revisit again. Okay? So these are the two attributes. So you're, it's, it's something you don't revisit. And second, you're completely internally satisfied and have uh, internalized that reality. So, how is the word yaqeen used in the Qur'an? We find the word yaqeen being used to talk about death. Hatta atanal yaqeen. وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ The word yaqeen is used in place of mawt. Why? Even the kafir for sure believes in what? Death. Death. You, you, you know, no matter if he, you could disbelieve in akhirah, you can disbelieve in the questioning of the grave, you can disbelieve in paradise and hellfire, fine. No one in their right mind will disbelieve in death. That is the absolute certainty. That's the starting point for any discussion. For anyone, they would, they would know. What is the certainty? In our future, what's one thing for sure? It's death. That's for sure. So it's so certain for everyone that Allah uses the word yaqeen for it. He uses the word yaqeen for it. Now we find in the Qur'an this idea of, you know, you accept it, it makes sense to you, but you don't want to really let it internalize inside. We find this concept in the Qur'an too. We find, قُلْتُ مَا تَدْرِي مَسَّاعَ إِنَّ ظُنُّ إِنَّ إِلَّا ظَنًّا وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمُسْتَيْقِنِينَ When you tell them about the hour, they say, Yeah, we've thought about it. Nothing more than a thought though. I th- we think it's a good idea. But we're not thoroughly convinced. وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمُسْتَيْقِنِينَ We're not ready to accept it deep down inside. Casually, it's an interesting concept, sir. It's a very interesting theology you Muslims have. That's as far as you'll go. <laughs> but you're not going to accept it as... Istiqan. You're not going to let it get deep inside of you. Inshallah. So this is this is the the uh, the tragedy of the one who doesn't have you.